to our candidate briefing with Dr. Roger Marshall, the Republican candidate running for the United States Senate. This special event is being hosted by the jo Johnson County Public Policy Council, comprised of the 10 Chambers of Commerce serving Johnson County. My name is Tony Rupp. I am the partner in charge of the Folston Siefkin office in Overland Park. I am here in my role as chair of the Overland Park Chambers Public Policy and Advocacy Committee, a role that I have held for several terms and that concludes with this event. Before today's event, the Johnson County Public Policy Council solicited your questions. Based on your input, the council met and chose the order of the questions that will be asked today. The format today will begin with Dr. Marshall's opening statement and will permit him to give a closing statement as well. In between, we'll ask your questions in an open-ended style. The topics uh, address the business issues raised by members of our audience and include tax policy, deficit spending, stimulus, business liability under COVID-19, healthcare, trade, and other questions. Let me now introduce you to Dr. Marshall. Dr. Marshall is a physician and fifth generation uh, farm kid who grew up in Butler County. Dr. Marshall attended Butler County Community College before earning his bachelor degree, bachelor's degree from K-State, followed by his medical degree from KU. He served in the Army Reserves for seven years and has practiced medicine for more than 25 years in Great Bend. He was elected to serve the people of the First District in the United States House of Representatives, where he now serves on the House Agriculture Committee and the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Dr. Marshall, you now have up to 10 minutes to give an opening statement. All right, Tony. Well, thanks for having me. And I promise I will take 10 minutes. You know, as I talk to chamber groups, I, you know, kind of get the question. So why, what makes you qualified to be your next senator? And one of my favorite answers is that I've signed a paycheck every other week for 25 years, that I'm one of you, that I am a small business person. I started off with a business of three people and ended up with over 300 employees where I took a group of doctors and led that group to build our own physician-owned hospital. Um, so I, 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 you know, healthcare, for instance, I've taken care of uh, patients, obviously, but I also know the part of running a hospital, overseeing health departments, purchasing health insurance for folks as well. So I understand uh, in a lot of ways what folks go through. I've been part of two other companies. I got in and maybe they had 50 employees, but both grew to over 300 as well. Um, you know, people think of me as a person from Western Kansas, but I've been invested in the Kansas City Metro for over 20 years, actually. Um, and if really my familiarity with Kansas City would go back, of course, to the KU Med Center days, lived about three blocks from campus. Our first daughter was born there. We now have four children, uh, two grandsons, one on the way. My next grandson is going to be born in Johnson County. So two of my sons are now. Are in businesses in Johnson County, including Farmers Bank and Trust at 143rd and Metcalf. Uh, we opened that campus in 2008. Very proud to be a member, an active member of that bank board an investor in it since 1999. And of course, I had to give up my bank board position uh, when I became a congressman as well, but also uh, been part of New Health, New Terra uh, since, gosh, about two, the year 2000. Today, while well, I'm, I'm in my car today, so forgive me, but I was entertaining Under Secretary of HHS, Eric Hargan. Secretary Hargan uh, is here at my invitation to do a healthcare innovation forum. Kansas City Metro has is some of the greatest healthcare uh, innovation businesses in the world. And several of folks from Kansas City have been there to visit him. They've invited him here and just uh, launching, you know, where does government healthcare meet private sector enterprise? And that's my sweet spot is developing healthcare innovation to of course take care of pre-existing conditions, but drive down the cost of healthcare. And I'm sure we'll get into that as well. Um, so very invested in, in Kansas City. One of my jobs as a congressman, I worked really hard, is, to, is connecting the big first district with Kansas City. So many of our commodity products end up coming through Kansas City. Our corporate offices are here. I think about, uh, you know, John Deere is a large engineering group here. Um, 
Bartlett Grain Corporate Headquarters, uh, Seaboard, and Dairy Farmers of America. And of course, Kansas City has the second largest uh, driving over it right now, incidentally, train, met, train uh, depot in the, in the country because it's full of my commodity. So worked very hard uh, on this. Agriculture is so important to Kansas and important to Kansas City as well. About 22% of the, uh, the Kansas City economics driven by agriculture. So those are good stepping stones. Uh, there's not a business in the in industry in the state that I haven't worked at growing up. I've done everything from work in agriculture to being a bartender at Kites, uh, banking, healthcare, oil and gas industry. Uh, so a very diverse investments that I think I understand business about as well as any congressman does and certainly understand the challenges of small business. I think I'll stop there if that's all right, Tony, and maybe let's jump into questions. And I think that your questions will help fill in some of the blanks I left out. Thank you, doctor. And uh, uh, this is a very 2020 conference with you in the car. I understand based on you being in the car and working from your iPhone that you will not be able to see uh, uh, the stop signs and, and the time limits as we go. And you have asked me to give you a one minute warning uh, if, if you get to that point and, and I will do so. And I just wanted to let the audience know that's why I'm, why I'm orally giving that, uh, that warning. Uh, we will now go to our question and answer session. You will have up to four minutes to address each, sec each question. First question deals with taxes. Taxes affect every business and individual. What are your views on federal tax policy? Well, I'm very proud of our Tax Cuts and Job Act. And we, we need to make those permanent, which is just the opposite of what would happen if we had a Senate Democrat majority. Uh, so that's why this majority is so important in the Senate. If, if Joe Biden were elected, if we would lose the Senate majority, those tax uh, breaks would go bye-bye. The average Kansas family kept over $2,000 of their hard-earned money. So we have to protect those. Um, I would also say this about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, is despite decreasing taxes, we had record income for the federal government. So the economy became, in my opinion, the, the, the greatest economy of my professional lifetime, partially because of that, but also rolling back regulations. And I'm not sure if there's a question later about rolling back regulations, but I think it's the two of them together which are the victory. Um, Overregulation creates uh, uncertainty and it creates consolidation of industry. We're seeing that in healthcare, we're seeing it in banking, in pharmacy, um, in, in the food processing businesses, in meat packing um, as well. So let's roll back regulations um, and, and keep our taxes low. And we'll stop right there. I think we'll talk about infrastructure later and how we're going to pay for that, though. So uh, I, I will be protecting the, the president and the Republican led tax. Doctor, the federal government has been spending at a faster rate than revenues coming in. This was true even before coronavirus. Deficit spending and debt have significant impact on our economy. How will you balance these practices with future needs? Right. So the, the national debt is what keeps me up late at night. And certainly before COVID, it was the number one thing that kept me up at night. And I went to Washington, D.C. with a plan, much like running a business. You go in and you see a business that's upside down. Number one, you try to increase income. And then number two, you try to cut your expenses. So the, the plan was, number one, is to grow the business. So if we grew the economy, we would grow our tax revenue. And that happened. Again, record income for the federal government. But certainly we have a spending problem. The next thing I did was assess, where's the low-hanging fruit? Believe it or not, the largest health the federal government's budget is on health care four times let me see yeah four times the size of defense spending so obviously that's my sweet spot so i worked so hard on on concepts with the white house and legislation that would drive the cost of health care down and we're seeing some of the fruits of that already uh, uh pharmacies are not going up anymore uh, they're down to like a zero to two percent growth so, for instance, a policy that I led 
uh, the FDA is now approving twice the number of generic drugs as they were before. Medicare Advantage premiums are going down because we're giving consumers more choices. Those same points would also work for healthcare uh, in the private sector as well. And then the big picture is we have to cut out the fraud, the waste, the abuse. We got to shrink the size of the federal government. And as people retire and quit, we got to we just got to put our put our belt on a little tighter. That's what we do in the private sector when a business is upside down. But America is going to have to be willing to go on a diet. We presented a balanced budget through the Republican Study Committee, and the president gave us a balanced budget. My business, I mean, in my office is more is that's the busiest week of the year when we present that balanced budget. Everybody in the country calls me and says. You know, our part of the federal budget is just only a couple billion dollars. It's a decimal place. Please cut everybody else's, but don't cut mine, right? So is America willing to go on a diet? And I don't mean a seafood diet where you see food and eat it. Is America willing to tighten our belts up? And uh, so we got to grow the economy and cut our expenses. There's no other way around it. I'll stop there. Doctor, every American business and individual has been affected by the pandemic. What would you propose or support, if anything, to provide further relief to Kansas businesses impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic to encourage recovery and economic growth? Right. So I want to accentuate what's working. I'm proud of what we've done so far. I think that our efforts have saved thousands of Kansans' lives We've saved over 500,000 Kansas jobs with the Paycheck Protection Program. I want the people on this call to know that since January the 28th, when I was the first member of Congress to go on the House floor and say, this is going to be a big problem. I called KDHE that day. I called the CDC that day. Actually, I called them a week before, and that's the day I finally got the phone calls with them to say, we've got to work on this. So since that day, I've been working on vaccine developments, uh, having the, helping the private sector respond with more testing, uh, with more innovative uh, medicines and new innovative tests as well. So proud of what Johnson County, the Kansas City metro area is doing. Uh, two labs that I know of have grown exponentially. Actually, I can think of three of them. And we've worked hard to connect those private labs with people across the state that need more testing as well. Um, we've got now have the point of care 15 minute test in every nursing home in the country, which is where half of the people are dying from. We've got the mortality rate from 4% to 0.4%. And the new medicine, the, the monoclonal synthetic antibody, will cut it again in half, maybe a fourth as well. On the economic side of things, very proud of the Paycheck Protection Program, which literally saved 500,000 Kansas jobs. A month before that came out, I was working with the SBA with community banks and lenders across the state um, to make sure that that was all greased up and ready to go. And now let's see what's what's been working. Here we are today. What the legislation we need right now, and this is based upon small business owners, number one, liability protection. Number two, more paycheck protection program money. We need to do something reasonable with unemployment insurance, but we can't be paying people $25 an hour to stay at home. We need some more funding to get the vaccines and and uh, the therapeutics across the road. We need monies to keep our kids in school. If we can't keep our kids in school, our economy is not gonna return to normal. Um, so those, those would be the priorities. But what we can't do is what the, the Democrats wanna do and that's borrow $2 trillion more. Really, we can accomplish this, I think, with $500 billion. We don't need to be bailing out governments that have been borrowing money uh, and bail out their pensions, those types of things as well. So those would be my priorities. Maybe last thing I would say is, you know, we gave the state of Kansas $1.25 billion. I don't think that half of that has hit Main Street yet. So let's let's do this other half billion dollars, which we proposed, half trillion dollars, excuse me, $500 billion. And then let's see where we are in a month, okay? So that those would be my priorities. You liability touched. protection. Let me say liability protection about three times. I think that's holding uh, our economy back. Unemployment rate across the state of Kansas, most counties are down to three to 4%. Uh, Johnson County, I think I saw was still at four and a half and Wyandotte at 5%. I checked on that a week uh, a week or so ago. So we're, we're getting there. Good job, everybody. Thanks for keeping your businesses open. 
Doctor, and you touched on this in your last answer, but uh, the next question is business liability protection. Uh, would you support business liability provisions that would help protect businesses from unwarranted lawsuits related to COVID-19? Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yes. You know, I'm the obstetrician that's been paying sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year for liability protection. Uh, this is a road that we've traveled down. Uh, the Kansas Medical Society did a program to kind of respond to that and make Kansas a better state. I got to tell you, our state, our, uh, our court, though, our Supreme Court in Kansas is really going to make it harder on all of us. So we've got to double down our efforts in Kansas as well for liability protection. But I've led legislation that would help with multiple liability protections even before COVID. Uh, I, I think that liability issues drive the cost of health care up 4 to 5%. And uh, certainly this, this is one of the factors that's keeping our economy from getting kicked uh, back on and running again. I'll, I'll stop there, Tony. All right, doctor, what are your views on the federal government's role in the healthcare system, including your views on the Affordable Care Act? Right, so, so first of all, both Republicans and Democrats wanna get rid of the ACA. Make no mistake about it. The Democrats want to replace it with government-controlled health care. Uh, whether you're talking about a government option, Medicaid expansion, those are all steps towards a complete takeover of health care by the federal government. Their plan would take away the health insurance that you get through your job. It would take away health care for veterans and dilute the health care that Medicare patients and current Medicaid patients are on as well. I want to take care of pre-existing conditions. So, of course, any legislation that I've worked on, the, the ads are absolutely lies. Anything that I've worked on will protect pre-existing conditions better than the ACA did. My own wife developed Crohn's disease when we were preg pregnant with our second baby. I know what it's like to have a small business with a wife with pre-existing conditions. If you don't have a pre-existing condition, you soon will, right? So, of course, we're going to take care of that. But then... The, the rest of the legislation, and you could go to the Republican Study Committee website, Republican Study Committee, I chaired the task force that wrote all that and we worked hand in hand with the White House on some of the policies and with the Senate leadership as well. And the whole emphasis is empowering patients. We want to empower patients to be consumers. The same competitive uh, economics that work in the restaurant business, um, that, that work in the hotel industry, that work in every industry involved with, will work with healthcare if we just get government out of the way. We have to promote transparency, uh, consumerism. Consumerism is allowing patients to be consumers again. Uh, we can expand healthcare savings accounts. I think healthcare reimbursement accounts are a great opportunity where you, you say, here the money is for your employee, you go take care of your insur insurance problems and, and that way you can take it with you. The only companies that I see that are keeping their cost of health care down right now are self-funded programs, which I've done for my own group of 300 employees, with direct primary care managing that. Uh, some primary care doctors and nurses who know what they're doing to manage health care costs. So my, my, if, if my plans were implemented, uh, it would just, just giving people pre-tax dollars is going to cut the cost of health care in half of them by giving having a state-ran a reinsurance program for the individual market uh, with anyone hitting a peak of $10,000 going into that, that's going to cut, cut, cut the cost of health care as well. More government control is not the answer. More government control is going to ration health care. I was just with the HHS undersecretary today. Uh, Great Britain does not cover hip and joint replacements. Need One minute for their seniors. So that's one example in Sweden, the socialized medicine program where they uh, are brag about, but what do they do for their seniors in nursing homes with COVID? Nothing, they let them die. We have the greatest healthcare system in the world. We've got to protect it. The greatest doctors and nurses and I'm, I'm very proud to be part of it. Doctor, what are your views on long-term funding solutions for transportation infrastructure? Right. So if you would ask me the things we did not get accomplished in my first uh, four years that I wanted to, this would be it, right? Uh, maybe the number one, uh, you know, balancing the budget, this would be a top three that we did not get accomplished. Um, 
the problem with living year to years is infrastructure, especially, is hard to, to plan when you're on a year to year plan. So we need a major 10 year plan for infrastructure. We need a strong economy to make that happen. We need a, probably a second term president that's going to have the guts to pass some type of a user tax, right? Uh, we're not going to raise people's property taxes or income taxes to pay for this. Uh, I've never seen the highways, the roads, bridges of Kansas in more ill repair than right now. We need a major plan uh, to do this, and it's going to take some type of a user fee uh, to get that accomplished. We haven't had a gas tax increase since the 1990s, um, and our trucks, uh, you know, you'll get two to three times better gas mileage than they did before. It, it's a priority. And when I talk about infrastructure, I got to talk about high speed internet, that that's equally important. Of all the opportunities I see for Kansas right now for infrastructure, I think one of the greatest investments we could do that would benefit all of Kansas would be to clean up the Missouri River and allow the bigger cargo ships to get up and down and get up to Kansas City and St. Joe. Um, so that would be a big priority for me as well that folks are overlooking that, that I think would be so beneficial to the wheat farmer in Atwood, Kansas, as well as the people in Atchison, Kansas, and all of the Kansas City Metro. So it is a priority. Uh, the question is how to pay for it. And, and that's where the arguments uh, start. We need to, uh, but if we have to, if we have to borrow money, this is a place I would consider borrowing money for. I think that infrastructure is an investment and it allows our economy to be successful. Doctor, in the big first district and throughout the state, international trade and tariffs are very important to the state. What are your views on international trade and tariffs? Yeah, so this has been a, an area where I've invested a lot of time. Uh, Bob Lighthizer, USTR Bob Lighthizer, has become a close personal friend, and that's because of our friendship with Bob Dole. Uh, Ambassador Lighthizer came in. Uh, to, to Washington, D.C. scene working for Senator Dole, and I met him at uh, Senator Dole's first birthday party I went to four years ago. Uh, because of those relationships, I was uh, invited by Kevin Brady to represent agriculture in the final round of the USMCA trade agreement. I worked so hard on the, uh, on, on the trade agreements, I was the only congressman invited by President Trump to go to the United Nations to sign the Japanese trade agreement. We've now renegotiated 55% of our ag export markets between Japan, South Korea, uh, China, Mexico, and Canada. That's 55%. We're now focused on Great Britain, the European Union, India. Uh, what am I leaving out? The African nations and Brazil as well. And certainly my focus has been on ag because that's the district I represent. But it'll be very easy to turn that into the bigger markets. Uh, the, I'm not a fan of tariffs but we were forced to use them, okay? The only way we got the Chinese trade agreement done was because of tariffs. Uh, and because of those tariffs and the trade agreement we've got done, we're now sell selling record amount of Milo and, and uh, corn to those folks. A Milo corn prices are coming up. Wheat prices are coming up because of those trade agreements. Right now, the big hitch with the European Union, they want to lock agriculture out of any type of trade agreement, but President Trump is saying no. And the only leverage he has is tariffs. Of course, I want free trade. I want balanced trade, reciprocal trade agreements. And these tariffs have been a necessary evil. Uh, but fortunately, with my relationships with the White House, when I shared with how those tariffs were hurting farmers, uh, we came up with using some of that tariff money to help the farmers out. Uh, so trade is a huge priority for me and will continue to be for, for all of us. Uh, so we'll keep working on, on those as well. Doctor, the next topic is immigration. What are your views on national immigration policy? Do you support reforms to assist with workforce shortages? You know, absolutely. And again, this is something I've already worked very hard on. Let me start by saying we need border security. We need border security. Otherwise, whatever rabbit hole we drop into with immigration policies, we'll be back revisiting it here in two years. We also need border security though, because of human trafficking and because of drug trafficking, all much worse than I would have ever, ever talked about or, or ever thought of, especially the human sex trafficking is just really exploding, unfortunately. The policies that I've worked on and got to the house floor uh, called for number one, taking care of the DACA kids 
And then number two would be fixing the high skilled visas issue as well as agriculture guest worker visa issues. There are solutions there. The solutions that I worked on got 90% of what everybody wanted. So we, so we had $25 billion in funding for a securing the border. We fixed DACA, we fixed the ag guest or worker visa. We made the skilled worker visa much improved but I couldn't get it across the finish line because people were upset that the other side was getting too much. And when I say the other side, this is not necessarily both sides, far right and far left, thought we were giving the other side too much. So the Democrats wouldn't vote for it because $25 billion was too much and some Republicans wouldn't vote for it uh, for, for just what we were doing on the specifics of the ag guest worker visas, et cetera. So it's been a priority for me. If you would ask me, uh, Pre-COVID, what, what's my biggest concern about the economy of Kansas that's going to be a tough one to fix? I would have said a lack of people for the jobs that we had, that that's a limiting factor that, you know, we, I just can't go out and, dr and drum up a bunch more people. Kansans are going to only be having 1.8 kids per family. So immigration is going to help stabilize this economy. It's the backbone of agriculture. 80,000 jobs in Kansas uh, dependent upon an agriculture guest worker visa, 80,000. Uh, so we've got to fix the system. We've got to fix it now. Uh, very frustrated that partisan politics have kept us from doing that. And you can count on me to keep working on it. I, I see a solution and I got this close twice before and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to stop till we get it across the finish line. Doctor, what are your views on national environmental policy? Yeah, you know, again, something very important to me uh, since being a young child as a Boy Scout, the first lesson we learn is to leave it better than we found it. I've always cared about the environment. My family and I have planted over 20,000 trees. Uh, my kids are still mad at me uh, for the hard work that we had to do. We've done lots of wildlife rehabilitation. We've owned land next to wildlife refuges and worked very hard on uh, cleaning up the rivers and, and doing systems like that. I've been a huge proponent in Congress uh, prop, um, in the Farm Bill of making sure that we have sound ecological policies that are helping conservation programs as well. And what I'm very proud of is American conservation and innovation, that our carbon footprint is at a 25 year low, that we've decreased our carbon footprint over 10% over the past decade, not because of federal regulations and taxes, but because of American innovation and conservation. So I believe in common sense approach to this problem that we're going in the right direction. This is a worldwide challenge. And, and frankly, uh, China, Brazil, India, these uh, countries are, are have some pretty low standards and somehow we have to bring them up to our, our bar as well. So I'm committed to leaving this country better than I'm, we found it. I'm proud that the waters in Kansas are cleaner today than it was when I was growing up. So let's keep going in that direction, but make no mistake about it. The Green New Deal uh, will we'll, uh, double our national debt. It'll be the end of Kansas agriculture, the end of the Kansas oil and gas industry. Um, it'll double your utility fee fees. Where else? It's gonna double the price of gas at the pump. And if we lost the Republican majority in the Senate, this is one of their huge priorities is this Green New Deal. It, I thought they were joking at first, so we have to make sure that that doesn't happen. Common sense, conservation, and innovation will solve this problem. I was on a phone call yesterday with Kansas State for a half an hour, just about actually an hour. Uh, we met some of the, just the great innovators in the world. So right now across the state of Kansas, working with carbon recapture and agriculture. And uh, what, can, what can Kansas State, KU do on that research areas? We're gonna have a, have a Mecca, uh, opportunity here in Kansas to be leading uh, where we're going to getting paid extra to grow crops which grab more carbon. Well, we had the technology to do it and uh, now we just got to start applying it. So I'm excited. This is one of my favorite sweet spots is fixing conservation. There's there's so many opportunities out there um, and I, I just want to make sure that my kids and grandkids have to get this out, enjoy the great outdoors just like I have. Doctor, we've had a lot of red team and blue team this year in a season of deep partisan divides. How will you seek to build unity? Yeah, and again, this has been a priority for me since day one. 
if you would come spend a day with me in D.C. before COVID, you would see the Democrat ladies hugging me and the Democrat guys fist bumping me. You would see us down in the gym playing basketball together at 5 and 6 p.m., working out together at 7 a.m. Thursday morning, bipartisan prayer breakfast, about 40 Democrat and Republicans get together and pray for our nation. Every Tuesday evening, I do a bipartisan dinner with the same 15, 18 Democrats and Republicans, my accountability group. Uh, we talk about everything but politics. Uh, my wife has incredible relationships. She's the secret weapon that I have. She just loves people. When she meets spouses, she doesn't even know if their husbands are Democrats or Republicans. Uh, when I went to, to the House Ag Committee, the first thing I did is made appointments with every member, Democrat member of the House Ag Committee, went to their office and said, Jimmy Panetta, you're from Northern California. Why are you on the Ag Committee? And he says, well, he's from the solid bull capital of the world. He needs mechanization, seasonal labor. That led to, to discussions on immigration where Jimmy and I got together, every freshman Democrat and Republican at a round table and talked about why is immigration important to you, which led to the legislation that we got to the House floor. So I'm already building those relationships. I have the relationships, um, the TV cameras, make things harder. Once those cameras go on, people retreat to their opposite sides. This is no different than business relationships that you all have, that, that you can have professional business relationships. You can be on a church board, a chamber board, a United Way board, and not talk politics to get policy done. As long as we can stay focused on objectives, I will talk to anybody. If we can agree on the same goal, that we both want a strong infrastructure plan, that we run a strong military, we run a strong economy, then I will stay there and talk till the cows go home. It's the, the issue is how we get there often, but if we can find that commonality, that common goal, then that's where the vision uh, happens and the, and the great jobs happen. And that's why we've got a bipartisan trade deals done, bipartisan farm bills done. That's how we funded the military. Uh, that's how we've taken better care of veterans out there. So the bipartisanship is happening, but you're not going to see it on the national news. And I'm telling you, if you're watching cable news after 7 p.m., it's not news, it's entertainment. So we've got to re-educate Americans on how and where to get their news from. Doctor, under our format, you have five minutes to give a closing statement. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, well thanks, everybody, for, for being with us. I, I just want you to know that every waking moment, of every day, I've been working to keep your family safe, healthy, and secure. Whether it's through COVID or secure billet, uh, borders, making sure we have a strong military and, and a strong police department. I'm working to keep you safe, healthy, and secure. I'm working to bring jobs back to America, jobs back to Kansas, and I'm working to protect Kansas values. The same values that have seen our forefathers through tough situations will get us through these tough days as well. Values like faith and family, uh, values like common sense and, and hard work. But I'm going to keep working to protect those values. I want to make sure that, that you all know that I'm going to work hard to protect your freedoms of religion, your freedoms of speech, your Second Amendment, the sanctity of life. That I'm going to work to protect those Kansas values. Make sure we confirm uh, constitutional Supreme Court judges like Amy Coney Barrett. That's, that's who I am. I've worked my whole life protecting Kansas values. I've done it in the military, uh, the, the OB floor, the halls of Congress, and I'm going to keep working as your senator to make sure that we have a safe and sound Kansas for the future of our children and grandchildren. I appreciate all the work that you all have done for being on the front line, for keeping the economy going. We're making it. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to get those vaccines out. I hopefully by the end of Thanksgiving for the vulnerable, for the rest of us in January, that you and your doctor decide if you want them or not. Uh, so in the meanwhile, again, I'm honored. God bless everybody. Uh, let, let's uh, get out there and make Kansas great. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and remind you that today's forum has been recorded and will be posted on the Policy Council's website, www.votejoco. Dot com. My understanding is I believe that uh, uh, this interview and the interview of Dr. Bollier will be posted by the end of the day today. Advanced voting by mail and in-person voting has already begun. Election day is November 3. 
Thank you for joining us. Have a great day.